All right, welcome everybody officially to the first sense making discussion for artists hosted by Legend Ear. You can find out more about our community and what we're doing at legendear.org. Uh, so the topic for today's first sense making call is how does the embedded artist respond? The idea of embedded art and the embedded artist is something that uh, many people in our community are already familiar with. And it's something that we would like to address in more detail uh, in upcoming videos. But for now, it should be enough to say that embedded art is about getting artists out of the studio, out from behind their phones, back into the world, back into active and reciprocal relationship with the world around them through their creative practice. And that applies whether we're in nature, whether we're in the city, at home, uh, or just in relationship with ourself and our history and our ideas. So with that brief introduction to the embedded artist in mind, uh, I would like to propose that we can think of a creative response in three stages. The first stage is an internal response that many of you will have heard Sterling and I talk about as breathing in. Before we can act meaningfully in a creative way, we need time to orient, to gather information and to clarify. What exactly is it that we're responding to? What's happening around us? Why am I choosing to respond in this moment? What are the conditions and the limitations within which I'm going to respond? Limitations of time, limitations of space, materials, access to information. The priority here is to enlarge your field of view as much as possible so that you can orient yourself. We rely on skill groups like observation, documentation, investigation, and reflection. The second stage of response uh, you may have heard us talk about as breathing out. This is where we think about producing the work itself, considering what skills and practices will be relevant and how we can frame a problem with constraints of time, space, and audience. But this is also where we come into direct relationship with context. We're no longer passively observing, but we're stepping into the frame. As an embedded artist, we don't just think about the outcome in terms of artworks, but we consider the act and the process itself part of the work. We're participatory and we become a factor and a variable inside the situation that we're working with. So here we decide what intention do we have for what we're going to undertake to do. What effect does this work have on an interpersonal level, on a community level, and on a global level? What reciprocal relationships and strong links do we develop as we stay on site and develop trust and accountability? The skill groups we use here are things such as ideation, problem framing, communication, craft, and organization, or project organization. And the, and the third stage is like the space between breaths, which we can think of similar to awareness itself or awareness of the act of breathing. It sits both after the out breath as a reflection stage and also determines the qualities of the next in breath in the form of the refinement of our intention. So here we step back to look at the situation as a whole. How did the intention align with the process? How did it align with the outcome? What links did we create? What cyclic relationships were established in those communities? And how does the response from that community to the project help me reorient towards what I'm gonna do next? And then beyond this entire process of reflection, to widen it out even further, we go to a frame where we can consider the strategic capabilities of art to shape society and culture. So what did we actually learn through this experience about the way that we think, about the way that artists function, about the way that our community functions? What structural, what structural shifts do we see as necessary in our industries or in the world? And what aspects of problem solving that are unique to artists can we extrapolate out into our communities? What tools and platforms need to be built so that artists have the training and resources to be able to accomplish what they know is important? So this is the topic. These are all of the questions. I know it's a lot that we would like to address in some manner. And the way that I would like to start uh, is by asking Sterling, uh, I'd like to separate into the practice of embedded art and the impact of embedded art. And so if we can begin, I would love to ask Sterling to talk a little bit uh, about his project, uh, An Unfamiliar Interval. 
a familiar interval or an unfamiliar interval, Sterling? Now I'm confused. It's both. Uh, it actually started as familiar interval and uh, it's become unfamiliar interval, I guess, by design. So I'm going to share something with you all here on the screen. And, um, you know, I, what I want to share today with you as a group is this, this notion that we are constantly as artists in the state of trying to make sense of things. And as we start to, to process and we evolve, we grow, we grow beyond our skill sets, we grow beyond certain uh, limitations within our jobs and opportunities. And certainly those of us who are living in the, the freelance world or have lived in the freelance world, you're perpetually seeking new opportunities. That, that in and of itself is a creative act and you have to apply everything that you know from uh, interpersonal skills to, to uh, pursuit of new technologies and leverage your own skill sets in order to find these opportunities and to find connection points between them. So I would say that if I can translate or, or provide any structure today that relates to past experiences and getting into opportunities that, that didn't exist or they weren't highlighted or featured or, or clear calls to actions, but recognizing patterns that existed between things, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway that I have to offer today. And we are going to be clearly in unprecedented times where we're facing uh, old pathways and old me mechanisms of finding compensation and opportunities are changing. And that's always been hard for freelancers, but I think that that's we're gonna find a whole new uh, group with different skill sets that are competing for different, different jobs. There's entire marketplaces that are going to be changing and altering. And we're going to have to continue to observe documents, gather our information, understand our limitations, and move forward with intention. And there's not going to be much downtime or wasted time in between those things if we uh, hope for our craft and our viability to survive. So what I'm sharing right now is really a project that started uh, in between running these expeditions. And a major reason you haven't heard from us in, in part or in whole over the past couple of years is I got to a place after running these expeditions with Adam where I decided to really start focusing on my own embedded experiences to, to really push the envelope to see what that looks like. This first project, this first case study that I want to share with you really started after Legendary Zion and it kind of continued on into our, our group trip to uh, the New River Gorge, but I noticed, as probably many of you have, have been on the expeditions, that when you're off the grid and you're no longer expected to be somewhere, that the communication stops pouring in, that the emails stop, that the expectation stops. And I always reveled in those opportunities where we had, you know, just downtime and I wasn't being tasked with new things to do. So I decided after Legendary Zion actually started in Zion to keep a, a notebook and that with every impulse I had to pick up a, a, a phone or a digital device, I picked up my pencil instead. So it's a real simple journaling process. And that started as drawings. It really started as just trying to see if I could document time. Now, more critically, the thing that I've always been trying to do as a professional is to see where I can align my personal interests and my professional interests. And I don't know about you all, but being in the studio is sometimes a blessing and sometimes it's a curse when I have a studio in the house and I'm not able to spend that time with my, my daughter and my son and my wife. It means that I don't think that I've aligned those, those actions and those methods in a way that's really the, the most conducive way to my own art and creativity. So I decided to turn the lens and to turn the pencil, if you will, and the focus on documenting the behaviors and habits of my family as a trial run, just to see if this framework could work in a very specific way. And so these drawings came out of it. Some of you have seen uh, the, the time journal sketchbook process that came from this, but these started as a deliberate action of not getting distracted with all of these virtual and digital things, but to really focus on those things that I found important. So I think that that's a really critical thing to, to share now that that's something I'm doubling down on 
and this downtime in between different projects and things that are happening while the world seems to be on pause and trying to find time to spend with the people that I want to spend with the most. And whether that's physically in the same space or virtually through something like this, I think that we all have that capability to, to really assess what's truly valuable and important to us. From I started keeping what I call embedded canvases. And these embedded canvases were placed throughout my home. So the examples on the screen right now, I hope that they're large enough here to see. Aunts to the subject matter of my family, trying to document time, but also a response to the limitation of how fleeting these moments were. So I might have 10 minutes between a project or 30 minutes before I have to run out the door. And I wanted to find a way of taking advantage of those limitations of time in a process to capture those, those moments. So these are multiple sittings. I think each of these pieces probably took place over the course of a couple of years. And you can see I, I developed a process where each new layer was a new drawing and it would get covered by another layer and another drawing, another layer, and another drawing. That by itself, as a practice of documenting this family life and routine, uh, meant that I had aggregated different moments in time that I would consider the breathe-in stage. The, the breathe-out stage was going back to the studio finally, where I had to finally curate some of the information and start tearing through these individual layers to reveal lost moments and forgotten times. So that's where this practice started for me and it developed into a series of paintings from there. So I think that this process, this, uh, this, this way of the technique, but just the knowledge and the understanding that we have things that are certainly worthy content, that we have things in our daily lives and our, our routines and our behaviors that hopefully you know, beyond the career ambitions and the wild aspirations. I'm talking about just the people that you choose to spend your time with. That's where the title came from, Familiar Interval, because I think that culturally, I certainly as an individual, but I think culturally we have forgotten to place emphasis and value on those things in a grand scale of just take, we take, it granted, take for granted the things that we see every day. And if we can just stop and pause, I don't think there's ever been a painter who has, has done anything of value, who hasn't had the same recognition that look, the things in our lives, those are the things that we're looking to paint and document. So this is the series that came from that. And yes, I think that having the pressure of a gallery and the expectation, convincing them that I, I was gonna have a show was, was important and had commercial application. But the short version of this is, this show was a, an absolute commercial failure, right? It was an absolute commercial failure. That wasn't the point. The point was to make the show and the things that have come from doing this series of work uh, has really opened up new opportunities where I want to talk a bit more about the impact of, of where this has gone. So plant that seed for a moment, a commercial failure. And by the way, I knew it was going to be, I wrote it on a card. I put it in my studio and we'll talk about that more, but uh, Adam, I hope that addresses some of the, uh, the, the practice of what I was trying to do of aligning personal interest and commercial practice and just not knowing how I was going to do it, but having that inquiry, can I bring these things together? So I hope that uh, with many of you here that resonates in a place where you are currently to provide just a bit of structure and thinking about the things that you see and that you take for granted. How can you assign those new value through your practice and through your observations? So I'm gonna stop sharing here, Adam. Uh, I'm gonna ask you the same question back just through your personal practice, do you have case studies and how have you seen that start to impact outwardly from, from that initial practice? Yeah, first I, I just wanna say, you know, the thing that I love about that project and I was, I was privy to that as it was going on and we were having discussions about it during the process. And, you know, the thing is for, for most of us, for a lot of us, uh, the studio is, is usually a separate place uh, from family or, or from home or from friends or from many of our other circles. And aside from the, the problem framing and the outcome of that as an exhibition, as a body of work, there's this really beautiful integration of a normally separate practice into the family environment. 
And that's something that we spoke a lot about. And it's something that, that in whatever form that takes, the integration of private practice into public spaces or into shared spaces is the idea that I just can't get out of the back of my head. So um, I, I don't have a slideshow of work to share because as some of you know, uh, what I've been studying for the last couple of years in Berlin are spaces that don't allow uh, photography and recording. So this is something that uh, when I arrived in Berlin, beyond the music scene itself and the culture of Berlin, the thing that struck me was this no photos rule in many of these spaces and the culture that that created, the culture of participation, of dropping into that moment of being aware of the people around you and holding that space to be there present in that moment. Um, and so I began to document uh, music spaces, so nightclubs, uh, jazz clubs, all of these different live music venues, as well as festivals, as well as uh, in private settings. Um, I also worked briefly with the, the State Ballet in Berlin. So all of these situations, uh, the thing that they had in common uh, was that they were intense, performative and creative spaces and that there was a prohibition on recording. And this meant that also in order to respect the subject and to interact with integrity, I had to reevaluate the idea of what it meant to share the work. So not only was I experiencing a new environment of creating in a place and, and drawing and sketching people in a place where things weren't normally allowed to be recorded, but I was also then having to formulate a response to whether I was going to share that on Instagram, whether I was going to share that uh, with friends or just here in the local community. And this is an ongoing question. Um, but that limitation of that environment actually forced me to reorient really seriously around the idea of embedded practice, because now my subject that I was studying was also my only audience, at least for a time. And so that was all I had was this cyclic relationship between the people that I was drawing and studying and the, the fact that they were my only audience and they were the only people who were going to, at least for the time being, interact with the work that I was doing. And so the act of drawing in those spaces uh, became less and less about gathering information for a project and more about examining exactly what my role was in that space. So how did I change the chemistry of a dance floor or a rehearsal just by my presence, just by the act of me being there drawing and having that visible uh, gaze on the people uh, who are usually in that private space? Um, how was I able to navigate those situations of permission became more of a question of eye contact and body language and the skill that I had to develop. There was a change in materials as well that came with that process where I had to kind of, you know, change to a, a different kind of darker pen that I could see in that environment when the lights were down and these kind of technical changes to the practice. But the biggest skill that I had to learn was an interpersonal one of, of how do you approach these intimate moments in these spaces uh, carefully and respectfully? And how do you communicate with people that you want to draw before you've actually made that initial verbal contact? So that was the biggest change to my practice. And it also was the thing that then, as I became more familiar with it, became the art form itself. The art form was using the act of drawing in that space to raise a question, to raise a particular kind of interaction. And the first interaction was usually, hey, are you allowed to be doing that here? So the initial point of contact um, brings up these questions about visibility, about privacy, and makes people aware of the surrounding that they're in and the rules of that uh, space. So that's the practice and as to the impact, after a while of doing this, uh, especially in kind of dance floor environments where people really weren't there necessarily in an artistic or creative capacity, but they were there to dance, they were there to party, they were there to, to have a physical experience. And people would see me drawing and come over and say, oh, that's, you know, they'd stand behind me and watch me draw. And then when I was finished, they'd say, oh, that's, that's really cool. And in the beginning, I'd sort of say, yeah, okay, thanks. I appreciate the compliment. And after a while, I realized it was a really important opportunity to actually ask 
what it was that they were responding to, <clears throat> to in that. And the answer that I got usually had something to do with watching you in the act of creative focus reminded me of my focus and what I'm really here to do. So it, it re-centered me, it realigned me to my focus, whether that's to really observe what's going on and to have an awareness of what's happening around me, or whether that's to focus on my dance, to focus on my physicality. But in these situations with so much distraction and so much visual information, it was kind of like a focal point, like a laser focus point through which people could reconnect to whatever it is they were there to do. And so I'm really interested now in the power of being witnessed in the creative act. So what it means for other people, whether they identify as artists or not, to witness you in the act of focused creation. Um, and I think that we as artists are masters of directing people's attention. That's kind of what we're trained to do inside the frame of a painting, as well as inside the, the broader context of our communication. Uh, and that's what we do by actually being present in a public space and making ourselves visible in that act of drawing or creating. We're directing people's attention back to something that we feel is important, either to the act of creating itself or to that thing that we're looking at. By me standing in a space drawing something, I'm making a really broadcasting, a really public statement of value of that thing. And it might be something that's usually overlooked. And so there's the potential for us to direct attention where we feel it's important just by focusing our attention on it. And I think the greatest thing that we have to offer other people in this moment that we're going through is our state. This is, this is not in this immediate moment, a time where we can share polished end products and fully realized bodies of work where we're sitting here in our homes via webcam and what we're offering to each other is us where we are right now, how we feel, what we're thinking and what we're going through. And so to be vulnerable and open to being witnessed in that act of creation is, is the project for me moving forward and hopefully the impact that I, that I can have. Um, Sterling, would you like to speak more to, to maybe some of the impacts that you've seen of that practice? Yeah. And, and, uh, Thank you, Adam. That, that's what, I'm excited to, to have you talk a bit about where you are and those limitations in your space. I know we're going to address that in a little bit, but you know, I, I look around and I'm I'm really fascinated by seeing your home studios. I'm I'm intrigued by the cameras that are on and and knowing that we are each living in a different environment and a different situation. And that's the type of thing when I say that we take for granted the things that we're familiar with. This is, I'm, I'm in the suburbs of Chesterfield County, Richmond, Virginia, which to folks around here isn't that enticing. It's not an anomaly, it's the, it's the norm. But to, to Bruno or to Adam or to, to, to Luke or anybody else, this is going to look completely different than where you are. And I think that there's something really engaging about being the anomaly, being the thing that is breaking the pattern. And what I'll share with you is that having gone through this series of, of creating this, what, what I really consider, it was kind of a prototype or a test of my theories, right? Of uh, doing the show and documenting this process. And, you know, I guess on the surface, it's like, well, great, Eureka, you kept a sketchbook. It's like, yeah, I've always done that. What, what else? So, well, from there, there was a new practice that developed because I was, I was really driven by um, frustrations and challenges of, you know, that started back when we first had my daughter and I had my first solo show and I was painting in the garage and we literally brought her home. And I was like to my wife, I said, I'm sorry. I just, the, the show's going up in, in less than a month. I've got to go work. And hearing my daughter, my newborn daughter cry through the door of the kitchen that shared the door of the garage. It was a really painful thing. And I think that something that's really, really key here is that, we are, are so often told to focus on our dreams and our ambitions. Well, the reality that we face right now, many of those things have changed, at least for the short term, maybe for the long term. And I think that there is going to be clearly frustration and challenges that come out of that. Well, I don't think that there's a greater motivator for us than 
wanting to solve those problems. We're, we're usually set on trying to solve problems for somebody else, for a global community, for bigger problems. And I think that you can truly start to take these, these uh, tools that we have, have uh, refined over the years and turn the focus back inward. And that's a critical step right now in this moment in time, I believe. Um, an interesting thing happened. I told you that my show was a commercial failure. So the first part of that story is that I sold one painting in the show to a lady I'd met at the, uh, the power company. Doesn't matter to the story. Um, and then I had another piece that some of you heard, heard me tell the story before, but I did a painting of our cat, Cooper. And my kids call him Coopy. And uh, he had passed away some time before when my son was three years old. So I did the show, I painted it, and I did this painting of my cat from my sketchbook. And I brought it down, I set it on the floor. And I go in the kitchen, I look back, and my son is sitting down in front of the painting. You know how kids kind of bend their knees back and they, they sit awkwardly like that. Well, he sat right in front of the painting and grabbed it by the sides. And he started looking all around the painting. And he looked behind it, picked it up. And then without me knowing it, he just kind of took his head and just put his head right against the painting. And I watched, I was like, this is, this is weird. This is strange. And uh, I was savvy enough to pick up my camera and film it. And he still wasn't aware that I was watching him. And I walked behind him. And this must have been five or seven minutes that he was engaging with this painting. And uh, it was a very textural painting. So he was rubbing his hands on it. And um, he finally realized that I was there and he kind of did one of these numbers. He goes, he goes, daddy, I, I really miss Coopy. And he had a connection to our cat who passed away two years ago when he was three. And um, so where that dovetails into the story is I had to send the, the show out. I had to sell the paintings. And I told myself, I wrote two note cards. One was, you will not sell any paintings in the show. The other one was, if you sell any paintings, I want it to be painful. These are my metrics that I established. How did I know I wasn't going to sell a show? It was too abstract for the Richmond market. It was too, the paintings were too big. I just, the gallery wasn't right. There were many things that were going against it, but I still knew that I needed to paint that show. And uh, so the, where that story ended up going, I, I have always tried to give my kids a sense that their artwork has value. And my son made a comic before the art, artwork came back from the show. And uh, I said, you know, I want to buy that comic from you. And he lit up. He was super excited. And I had this little uh, a pocket full of dollars and change. And I gave him like a dollar seventy eight or something. Uh, and he got this little plastic container, this plastic uh, toy pot, and put the money in it and ran away and sold me his book. He tries to sell me everything at this point, but that's, uh, that's a whole other story. So the paintings come back and that painting of Cooper was with the paintings. Now, even though I knew that this was going to be a, a, a show that didn't sell, I'm still depressed by the fact that it didn't sell. I mean, I, I would love to have sold the pieces and um, parted ways and, and made some money for the, the two years that I worked on the show. But uh, the painting comes back. My son's helping me out with the show. And I, I watch him as he gets to that painting of Cooper. He sees it and he lights up again and he runs inside. And the next thing he does is he comes back and he hands me that pot of money. He says, daddy, I want to buy your painting. So that was the second painting that I sold from that show uh, for $1.78. And uh, you can't put money on, on something like that. It, it's, it's something that's an uh, uh, irreplaceable moment that I had with my son that came from an observation of things that I felt were important, that connected with him as well as the rest of my family. And uh, anyways, it's, it's an anecdote. I'm sorry to be a little bit long-winded there, but I think it's an important connection about what true value is and where it comes from. So externally, a commercial failure, internally within my family, uh, probably the most important painting I've done to date. So my boss at work at the university sees the, the, the show that I, I did and he goes, you know, there's an illustrator from the 60s. His name is Brian Sanders. And he was doing this behind the scenes sketching for uh, 2001 Space, Space Odyssey for Stanley Kubrick. He created these beautiful drawings and, and paintings. He goes, 
you should do that for SpaceX. Now, my boss, fortunately, is a really wonderful mentor. He's the best mentor I've had. But he planted the seeds like, wow, I, I should try to do this for SpaceX. I was like, yes, I should. I should do this. Not having any idea on how to get there or any plausible expectation that it would happen. But it set me onto a path where I started looking into the space uh, you know, evolution and, and these different companies doing different things. I was able at that point to put a proposal together uh, to document and record through embedded practice the uh, space launch for SpaceX. And I used the resources at my disposal, which were to, to present this to the university. And they sent me down to Cape Kennedy um, to document the unmanned Dragon crew launch. While I was there, I met some uh, scientists from NASA. I showed them my sketchbook that I was showing you pictures from, and nothing really came of it. I documented the space, uh, the, the launch, which was amazing, and I came home. Three weeks later, I get a call from the sister of one of my former students who uh, works at NASA, and this this kind of sussed out in my my hustling while I was down there, and she's like, Sterling, I got a project for you. And that's how I came to start working for, for NASA. And uh, some of you have had personal conversations with me where I've said, yeah, I would love to have artists be able to sit at the table with engineers, scientists, doctors, uh, policymakers, politicians, because I think that we can add value. And that's something that, that hopefully is proving out in this case. So um, this next series of work came from yet another invitation from my boss. He said, you should do this type of work down at the hospital connected to the university. Now, before some of you say, yeah, you're, you're so lucky to have these connections at the university, um, to, to have these institutional points of connection. Yes, I am very fortunate to have them, but none of this started before I did the work. I couldn't hypothesize it, I couldn't predict it, and I had to put something out into the world for people to respond to something that wasn't there before. And that's part of this equation, right? So you, you aren't expected to be original, expected to be original. You aren't expected to create things that people haven't seen before. We're creating new opportunities and new ideas from existing things. And it's finding those connecting points between those existing things where opportunity lives. So he kind of pointed me towards the direction of the hospital again, not doing the work for me. And I followed some, uh, some points of connection and this next, about, next body of work has come from, from that. So this is a, a series of drawings. It's called Unfamiliar Interval because that was, again, by design, Familiar Interval was focused on the family. Unfamiliar Interval was trying to find situations to put myself into that were outside my comfort zone, that were outside my normal habits and routines. So for the past year, uh, up until last week, uh, when, when I was told I can no longer shadow the surgeons, I've been working at the, uh, the hospital's burn center and uh, cardiothoracic units where I've been going through clinicals as well as into the operating rooms. And um, that's been paradigm shifting for me. So these are, this is an aggregate of clinical observations of different patients. And I want to draw attention to this uh, this young girl up top here, if you can see my, um, my cursor, I'll speak about her in just a second. Uh, this is in the burn center, 13 year old boy, cardiothoracic and, you know, seeing people who are, you know, I, I, this has made me more than ever feel like I'm, I'm just so fortunate to do what I do. These are people who right now are the tip of the spear with this outbreak and they are addressing things that are life and death. And I've been in these surgeries where they're quite literally holding somebody's heart in their hands. It, it's really, it, it shapes and reforms the way that I have thought about things considerably. So um, these drawings in and of themselves, they have value to me. They've changed my outlook. But just like Adam said, it, it's been in these situations where you are the anomaly, you are the master of attention. Uh, I love that phrase that he used. Um, you're a master of directing attention. I couldn't help it. If I was in the surgery, the, the operating room, I kept getting approached by different uh, 
surgeons and technicians and uh, residents, and they would come up and say, so you're just here drawing? And they didn't mean it to be dismissive, but yeah, I was in a non-critical role in a critical surgery. And there's something very displacing and jarring about that as an individual that was also unsettling for other people that were there. And it, it took a semester of being in this routine, getting people used to me being there, understanding that um, there was something else I had to do. And what's come from this in my in-depth conversations with uh, Dr. Feldman, who runs the burn center, he's the surgeon there, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Kazarajan, who runs the cardiothoracic unit, were a number of opportunities to interject technology, to interject creative thinking, uh, design thinking, to start to build bridges from the other campus where I work at the School of the Arts, to students, and you know, just seeing things going from that patient I mentioned before, that young girl, um, here, who had a, a, a uh, prosthetic attachment to her ear that was two pieces of plexiglass held together with screws and realizing that we can do better than that. And I, I went back to a student in my department who's into 3D modeling, 3D imaging, 3D printing. And I said, I got to get you connected back down to the other campus. And there's been a number of things that have come from those opportunities, but I, I'm saying this because the first step is observation. Once you observe and you understand your limitations and the boundaries, you can start to identify patterns. And if you can identify patterns and think creatively in those types of situations, you can start to identify ways of actually connecting those things together and building bridges between them. There's a lot more that's come from this project. Uh, I won't get into it anymore right now, but uh, I hope that gives a bit of framework in what's happened from something that started in my home and has branched out into something that's uh, been much larger that, that uh, is this point of connection with surgery. And the long vision now is how do we bring uh, surgery and space together? And we're, we're exploring where to bring the NASA component together with the surgical component. So everything is a learning experience and it's presented more opportunities and more open doors, but it requires somebody who's creatively thinking to stitch those things together. So I, I hope that gives a bit of perspective on that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm so happy that we can see all of that work together because I think that you've demonstrated all of those stages in a really clear way. And I think that that even, even on a macro level from that first project to what you're doing now, there's this shift from a, an internal response in your own situation to this question of how can I be involved and embedded in these different communities and these different institutional frameworks. And I think now the position that we've got to as Legendeer and why we're bringing this community together now is, is to look at those processes and then to look at this bigger question of, of why is it suddenly the case that we need to be in these environments? Like, like art clearly has a role to play with a particular kind of thinking, with a particular kind of free association and, and lateral problem solving, where we can embed ourselves in those spaces, build trust, and then create connections that would normally be overlooked. Because a lot of people in those spaces, I think, are trained in a very particular sequence of actions to respond to a very particular problem. And that's, that is their domain. And so to suddenly have somebody who's a who's a bit of a, a different variable from another domain to be resident in that space to say, you know, you probably never considered this, but why don't you talk to this guy over at NASA and being at NASA and saying, have you considered talking to the Burns unit over here? And there's all of these kind of lateral connections that start to happen. And so this is the bigger question of what role does artistic thinking have to play in this situation in the world right now? So thank you for sharing and uh, would really like to open this up now uh, to an open discussion. If anybody has questions, um, we can begin with, with questions. And then I'd also love to hear uh, from all of you whether there are examples of 
practice shifts in your own work or that you've seen in the world uh, and examples in your own work and in the work of others of impact, of the impact of artists uh, being in the world and integrating their practice with the communities around them. So uh, let's begin with questions. If anybody has something to start us off. If I can say something here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to call you out a little bit, uh, Emily. Um, it's so good to see you, by the way. Um, hey, <laughs> you too. I've always watched your career, and Emily was a student in at VCU uh, years ago. I had the the privilege of actually teaching her uh, and learning from her as well. But um, your business model has been an outlier from the start. And, you know, I remember you talking to me about wanting to start a mural company and, and like, yeah, how, how am I going to help this student? <laughs> but, you know, there are so many of the, the principles that were applied that were universal and they always are. Um, you're in a situation right now where, you know, painting murals is going to be changing uh, a good bit for the foreseeable future. Um, but you've always done such a good job of assessing the, the limitations, the, the, the boundaries, the challenges. And I'd, I'd be really curious, I, I think that yours is a great case study just to even talk about how you started that business in the first place and how you started pulling some of those resources together. And if I'm not putting you on the spot too much, I, I think you might have something specific to say to it. Sure. Um, well, I'm considering sort of the challenges ahead in terms of not being able to maybe go outside, so not being able to maybe paint a mural outside. Um, I think that uh, Adam's points about being, you know, directors of attention like that um, ends up often being sort of the crux of the concept of the murals that I'm asked to paint because people come to me and ask, um, uh, okay, so to speak to how the business started, like um, I erred towards this because I didn't want to generate my own concepts and, and content for these murals and having client work tended to put me in the position that they gave me a starting seed where I felt that I didn't have that starting seed. Um, and then I could grow that into something interesting and inspirational. And so um, what often people give me is uh, the prompt of, you know, we want this mural to reflect our community in, you know, different words. Um, and so they put me in the role that I think you're broadly assigning to most artists is that we're here to reflect the state of the community onto back onto itself so it can see more clearly um, what it looks like, what the shape of it is. Um, my position doing that now is challenging, you know, not potentially being able to do the normal kinds of research that I would do going around and talking to people face to face or visiting different areas of a neighborhood or that kind of thing. Um, but the role itself stays very important. So I think changing media might end up being the important thing to do or adapting my media to some other form of dispersal. I don't know. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with it. Uh, simultaneously, though, um, I've been leading a group in Richmond called RVA Makers for a few years. Uh, I was president for two years. It's a nonprofit group. I just stepped down as president, but we are the group in Richmond of people that make stuff. Um, there's a lot of overlap with the art community. There's also a lot of overlap with uh, the science and engineering community. Um, and right now, actually, before this phone call, I was talking with that group about how to how we can, as the board, leverage the almost 5,000 people in that Facebook group to potentially help the community that we're in and help each other as most of us are self-employed or freelancers or contract workers, whatever it may be. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of problem solving with changing information. Um, I might be rambling now, but. <laughs> That's what's going on with me. <laughs> Emily, could you repeat the name of that group, please? It's called RVA Makers, so Richmond, Virginia Makers. Yeah. Um, 
and it's a Facebook group that, um, frankly, anybody is welcome to join. We have the page, and then we have a group that's called RVA Makers Forum. Um, it's, of course, directed towards the local, the physically local community. Um, but if we come up with good ideas, we'll try and share them. Okay, thank you. And I, I think that just like this group, we're gonna see that people are, are using these tools to band together and to gather and to share resources. Um, I, I would say that for all the things that I've been involved with for the past two years, you know, I, I always want to make sure that I give credit. And I know I, I did mention my boss, uh, Ty Ruben Ellenson, but um, I, I think that we can all use that. And it doesn't matter where we are for people to look at our work, to assess what skill sets that we have, again, that we often take for granted and say, you know what, you should think about connecting with this. You should think about this over here. And I, there's something empowering about it. There's something uh, that, that removes it from ourselves and this pressure of getting to a place where we're trying to figure out which pathways we need to open up and someone validates it in an instant because maybe they're an expert or maybe they're just knowledgeable or, or maybe they see an opportunity. And I will say that within a community, you end up with more nodes of connection and more potential for people to see what you're doing and to say, you know, have you thought about this thing happening here? Maybe Beth says, uh, you know, in Canada that we're, we're working on, and, you know, th there might be a, a point of connection there, but I think that the more minds that are sharing in these types of conversations, the more opportunities to find points of connection. And uh, that, that's, we're so used to having to do that on our own, that it really is helpful to have somebody who's outside be able to say, yeah, you should, you should just give this some thought. That's all it took for me. So Emily, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but um, you know, I, I'm seeing, you know, Ev, you've started your own studios. I mean, that, that's just a remarkable uh, action of, of jumping in to, to do something that exists in the industry where you've taken an initiative that's, that's enormous uh, to, to start something like that. And Julia, I've seen your, your pursuits with tying in your personal interest in your career and, Jason, you as well as a as a guide uh, into bringing these these new initiatives. Luke, everything that you're doing at the uh, at the zoo and uh, these workshops, we're all trying to figure out these points of connection to bring that attention and that anomaly into situations where something like that didn't previously exist. So I just want to point those things out uh, as the conversation goes on. Hey, Emily, uh, would you mind sharing us uh, a, any link to your art? Because when I search uh, RV makers, I just see a lot of pictures of this, oh. these cars that look like houses. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So um, I'll put that in the chat. I'll put a link to my website in the chat. Um, and then I'll put a link of the um, RVA makers Facebook forum in the chat as well. Cool. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, over the last uh, week, as we've been seeing all of this uh, rapidly unfolding change, Who's been keeping a pulse on art stuff? I mean, I, I feel like I've barely had time to keep up on, on the usual channels of, of art information. Has anyone been actively looking at, I mean, I know I've seen things like, uh, you know, galleries reorienting around doing online shows, uh, you know, people kind of pivoting in that way, but has anybody seen any or would like to share any examples of uh, kind of really creative thinking around the situation from artists, either in your networks or, or just generally? I've, I've seen more from musicians, um, possibly because it's, it, it's, it's a shorter production time to, to put out a piece of music or dance. And that's something you can upload. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say, I'm, I think for me, I'm looking more for ideas on what can I do? How can I, what can I produce? What, what venue uh, kind of thing? towards this? That's a very vague question, I know. But. Well, I, I think 
in the short term. My uh, my response to that uh, question, Beth, is uh, we're moving from the the focus of the artifact to the focus of the image or the idea, right? And while things relative to manufacturing, to the sharing of, to the physical um, sharing of space and, and paintings or, or whatever they are, that's clearly being put on hold for the foreseeable future. And we're getting into a place where we have this uh, renewed focus and interest and in, in push towards intellectual property. Now intellectual property might relate directly to storytelling, but I would also say that I'm seeing, uh, Adam, in response to your question, everything is being forced to go online. Everything. And, you know, I'm teaching at a university and I have my first online class tomorrow. And I teach at a university where for 15 years, they've been trying to put education online. They can't get it done. And now we're given a week to do it. Right. So it's just, it's crazy. It's changing everything. I was having a conversation with my dad. Some of you have met him. Um, and he, he told me, he said, look, I know that things are changing. It doesn't mean that all the doors are closing. He says when do one door closes, another one opens. And I would cl clearly people are going to be posting educational content. They're looking to organize communities. They're looking to, to put things into action and, and to find different ways of generating revenue to bring income in. And I think that there, there's no reason not to talk about those things because those are critical. Those are critical. We can't, sustain ourselves in this current economy, the way that it's set up, without addressing that there is a need for revenue and there is a need for, for finding different sources. So that's going to change. And there's going to be some people who are at the, uh, the vanguard of that, who are actually finding ways of taking existing tools and using those, exploiting those, using t tools and changing them and adapting them. Um, but Beth, to your point, to your question, I, I think that it's, you can always look back at this Montessori model I've referenced quite a bit, where, yes, there are a lot of experts who are going to probably flood the, uh, the marketplace right now for digital products, digital education, <clears throat> tutorials, and, and everything in between. But there's also something immensely empowering about finding somebody who is honest with, this is my situation, and this is what I'm choosing to do with it. And they don't have to be the best person in the world at what they do. They just simply have to know something about the process, the methodology, the skill set, the tools that somebody else doesn't do. And we're not trying to come across in any regard as, as um, false prophets or anything that, that's disingenuous. But I think that there is going to be a hunger for knowledge and a hunger for resources and best practices that is going to come out of this where people are being forced to, to deal with their own limitations of financial uh, situations as well as uh, something as, as banal as boredom. And how do they address this time that they have that was being so focused on professional pursuits and other things that now they find themselves in their homes with the people they care about over long periods of time. And uh, I think that, that that's not an answer as much as just an observation that uh, it's going to require that we, we start to look and that we are open to, to trying to figure out how we pivot. I want to um, put a couple of thoughts in here. Adam's question was so broad, I thought he was asking about museums or larger cultural, cultural institutions, because I think those are, um, they have more resource than I have in my studio here. Um, but I can say from a tactical point of view, as, uh, and I, as an artist, as a working artist, I had a big plan this year, and this is, uh, put a little monkey in the wrench in that plan. Uh, like, like Emily, I can't really go out of the house. So that puts, um, the plan that I had in play just in a place I'd have, I have to retool. One thing I've found helpful is I've been calling all of the software companies that I've been working with 
and negotiating new rates with them to get it down. And that's meaningful to me because the income stream that I had been building, I've just done three shows in four months and it was going somewhere. It's, it's just abruptly stopped and that's fine. I can retool. I can find things that I, I always have about five plans I'm working on. So it's a matter of picking up one that's more suitable to my current environment, but my cost structure was built for another plan. So I think from the, how do I see it shifting on a personal front? Personal artists, we can take steps to limit the damage of this year. And I really want to say that out loud because I didn't think it was possible. I just spent four hours on hold yesterday <laughs> getting a hold of various companies. And I, I think I saved $400. It's not minor for me right now. So if you're looking at your tool set, Adobe, um, you know, Art Archive, um, oh God, who else, you know, Find, look at your look at your tax return. <laughs> Any of the software companies that are listed there, um, all of them worked with me. There wasn't an exception in there. So that's a tactical thing that I've changed. And you know, on the where does the plan go front, I'm, I'm probably closer to Emily. I'm reeling a little bit, and I have a whole host of personal jobs that just got added to my list that weren't on my list two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm the, the new homeschool teacher <laughs> for two different grades. So, you know, life got really different really quickly, and um, I haven't even unpacked for my last show, so <laughs> I kind of have to do that too. Um, but in terms of the larger cultural institutions, I think I'm looking for something in between. I'm looking for the artist on the street and, and what that embeddedness looks like. My, my artwork has always been a combination of the shows that I've done, which has been a concerted effort this year to get out and sell and uh, make some money off this stuff. And the more embedded um, exchange of concept usually in multiple languages, usually not even in any common language using visual art. That, that's been removed for now and I'm really missing it. And I know it's impacting my business because that's where a lot of people find me and follow me. I'm out in the world producing art and they're, they, they discover the joy of either what I'm looking at or the process itself. So that, <laughs> that's a trickier question and I haven't quite, uh, I haven't quite figured that out yet. I, so stay tuned. <laughs> And uh, Heather, if I can, uh, what I would say to you, just knowing you, knowing your life experience, knowing what you've gone through and what it's taken you to go through art school, your story has value, right? Your story has, it's, it's unique. It's weird. You know, my story's weird. We're all weird. There's no normal. I don't know anybody who's normal. Um, but I would imagine that there's an entire group of people in the world who can hear your story and be like, you know, now I'm homeschooling two kids or a kid. I mean, my, my wife is down here now. We just got news today that um, they've closed school for the year, you know, and that's, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a devastating bit of news for the kids and for us, but we're going to adjust. And uh, I think that with your personality, Heather, your ability to talk to people and to engage, that isn't lost online. That isn't lost in the virtual space. And whatever foundation we set now is the footprint for what we'd use moving forward. So I would encourage all of you to really, as, as Heather's saying, go through your, your tax statement. That's taking stock, right? That's, that's looking at hard cost of money in, money out. That's financial. But take stock of your limitations and your resources because those things oftentimes, if not always, are also the opportunities that you find. And, you know, it, it's, it's the, the artist who has endless possibilities that struggles. It's the, the artist who identifies their intention and their limitations that figures out how to change their current state and move towards something that's a goal worth achieving. So, I, I, Heather, you're a great point of reference, as is everybody in here that I've met. Your story is unique and distinct, and I don't mean that uh, topically. I mean, truly, if you find a way to share that and to connect with folks, that is going to have value. Hey, Sterling, I think we have a question that you can answer. Ray is, uh, has a question about the, the process of pitching and wants to know, uh, how do you pitch an idea for an art community without risking your intellectual property being uh, uh, like stolen in the process? 
That's how do you pitch yeah. an idea to read the, the second part of the question side? You know, Adam and I have had this conversation kind of recently, just uh, you know, about people taking too much and people taking ideas, and even things uh, that we haven't talked about. Where I've sent proposals out for my observations at the hospital that went to my my boss, who I mentioned before, and then within a day, the statement comes from the university and the school uh, of the arts. Oh, we're establishing this. Uh, this health and arts innovation space is like, I, it's one of the things I proposed in my paper. I don't think it was anything uh, that was uh, taken, but that collective consciousness of how ideas evolve and shape. Um, the best advice I got recently was, you know, because I, I, I went up for some grants and uh, I was talking to the guy who was helping me out. So it's how do I safeguard myself from being, plagiarized and people within the university taking my ideas and people outside that. And he goes, well, the first thing you do is when you correspond with people, you make sure that you're doing it via email. And if somebody says something to you that you can confirm, you write back immediately and say, thanks for the time. I appreciate you meeting with me. Uh, just to be clear, we discussed this, this, and this, and we, you know, you said you were going to do this, this, and this, and just having a track record there is, potentially very helpful to you. Um, there's also the, uh, the, the idea that you just, you go out and you become undeniable, that you protect your ideas as long as you possibly can, and then you release them into the world. And I think that, uh, I, I, Ray, I don't have a, a great answer to that because I feel like I've been leaned on quite a bit and I've taken from other people early in my career. And uh, I think that's the nature of how we learn. But to protect these ideas, I, I would say that it's always better to be further along in your concept and your idea that you've actually invested some, some uh, elbow grease and some, some effort into realizing them so that you have a tangible thing to show is always going to be insulating you more than just, Hey, I have an idea. I'm going to put a pitch together and see if anybody bites. So, you know, let, let me put it in another framework. Uh, things on Kickstarter have run a couple of campaigns that have gotten funded um, the second one, which by the way, anyone who bought my book, it's, uh, it's going up through Egypt right now. I'm not sure how long it'll be quarantined in New York once it gets there, but, um, it's, uh, I was much further along on that project where I'd done the work because I wanted to do the work. And then I found a body to put it in or a mechanism, which was the book itself. Prior to that, my previous Kickstarter campaign was a show that I was painting where I had a couple pieces, uh, realized, but. I wasn't far enough along. And for anyone who's done this type of thing, it's no fun to get paid all the money up front. So if you've done freelance work, if you have someone say, oh, we'll pay you everything up front and then you do the work, that is the, the most destructive way of having me work. Give me half and I'm okay, uh, but give me all of it. And I, I'm just like, what am I working for, right? So I don't know if that helps you at all, but um, I think that there's, there's uh, some, some help with that non-disclosure agreement uh, uh heather said that as well um but that's my best advice heather you want to speak i, I know you've been in marketing for a long time Do you want to speak to the ndas actually the ndas would come from my research uh my research uh days sterling and um i <laughs> I try not to say this too much. I have my name on a patent, so this is stuff we care a lot about. <laughs> and uh, it, the non-disclosure agreements for the science community are just necessary. It's just a necessary part of uh, working. But I kind of like some of the other uh, suggestions that I'm seeing here, which is NDAs for artists, which would be a little bit more applicable. And then, you know, I had a, I had a teacher, she was in the um, fashion design group at uh, the school. And uh, somebody asked her that question. They said, how do you stop people from stealing your ideas? She said, I'm just better at my job and can stay ahead by reinventing myself so fast. It doesn't matter what they steal, it's in the past for me. And she said, so I simply never worried about it. No, it's not quite what Ray's asking about, but it's something to keep in mind for all artists because we are definitely, uh, prime for things being stolen. I mean, visual imagery, right? People probably stole a bunch of our images and some of us don't even know it and they're profiting off that. Um, so you have to decide how much you care about that. If you want to, if you want to care about that, you can use things like Google 
image search and you can go after them for revenue. But um, for this, this is idea based. So anyway, it's a long rambling response to NDAs and then paper trail, like what you said with the emails and um, getting your idea far enough along. Ideas, people get really excited at the early onset of ideas and they don't actually develop what does that look like. Even if you get it wrong, it doesn't actually matter. You just have to define what you see in it, pull a pilot together, even if it fails, whatever failure is to you, you've tried something and you're learning from it. So uh, these are things that I would take from my science days. You try, you fail, it doesn't matter. You learn, you pick it up, you do it again. Um, those are two cents. Thank you, that's great. Sterling, um, you know, if I jump in on what you had said a little bit about um, kind of how there's gonna be a lot of those professionals dumping their online courses and tutorials out and kind of how it might feel make us a little reluctant to do our own kind of work in that way. Um, so for me, I had been, what I felt like was really embedded living down in the Smoky Mountains National Park as a teacher of uh, students who came and stayed in the park for multiple days uh, doing outdoor education. And of course, we can't pull students from schools all across the Midwest and the Southeast currently to one place and you know stay in a residential dorm during this time. So we've actually been very lucky that our place is uh, still paying the employees for the time being, uh, a lot of my kind of colleagues within uh, environmental education for youth uh, do not have that luxury right now. Um, but then on top of that, I'm able to come back to Cincinnati uh, to be with my fiance, but then also to make art for Tremont to try to create things to help those kids who are all now at home and those parents who need things for their kids to be doing uh, to help them stay connected to nature and stay connected to what it is we do there. Uh, and at first somebody was a little bit concerned about, you know, like, oh, all the other zoos and museums are making the same things, why should we do it? Um, part of the answer is that you have an audience already who wants to, they, they're looking for what you're making. They wanna hear, you know, for us, it's like they wanna hear from Tremont and see what we make. And you're kind of right in that like, when I had all the possibilities, I wasn't always making as much art, but now when I'm in this apartment trying to make nature art for kids, it's kind of like the box that is giving me the time to actually produce work every single day that is gonna be out there, uh, helping kids really stay connected and helping them create their own creative work. Um, so that's kind of where I'm currently at with that. Luke, that's great to hear you talk about that too. And I, you're just a great example of, uh, you know, officially your title is, I mean, you have been a zookeeper, correct? Um, say a zoo educator. Zoo educator. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's something to that credential that means something in the world, right? And as you start talking about these things, you might get another artist who's doing uh, art that's inspired by nature, but they certainly don't have that title that you've earned uh, that gives people confidence that you know what you're talking about. And, you know, I, I can even see your perspective being one where you say, you know, I miss being outside. I miss being around the animals. And I was thinking today about my experience, and you can go off into an anecdote or a story about a certain thing that you did or that you saw or that you shared with somebody else. And it comes back to that personal experience, that personal um, thing that you you witnessed or you you uh, engaged in that is authentic that is truly at the heart of why people would seek you out my uh, my wife has found her way to uh, mo willems uh, he's the artist in residence at the Kennedy Center and he's found himself at home and he's doing online uh, lessons for kids and you know like he could have gone a couple different ways with it he could have said, you know, I'm going to, uh, to teach professionals how to be a children's book illustrator. But what's more authentic to what he's doing right now is like, no, he's teaching kids how to draw and how to do it uh, in a fun way and an engaging way. So um, it, it's going to take some real initiative and it's going to take embracing technology tools and things that some of us just aren't comfortable with. 
Um, but there are resources out there for that. And there are going to be people who are walking you through how to do things like that. If you're skilled there, that's wonderful. You can help somebody else out. And, you know, I don't want to double down on focusing on just how do we make money. That's critical for many of us, but also how do we make meaningful work in these situations? I, I want to say something here, Adam, and I, I'm sure you can touch on this too. I, I, I see what well, we've got 26 people in here today, 28 probably that have been through here. Um, we have, if you believe that we have a role as artists to document the time in which we live, what wild and interesting and unprecedented times we're leading right now. And you aren't expected as an individual to, to capture everything, but to capture part of that. Think about the aggregate that comes from this when we all start to share our notes and our sketchbooks and our drawings, when this passes, and it will pass, of what that looks like at this moment in time. Think about all of these artists who all of a sudden were distracted, were being pulled in, in just tons and tons of directions, who finally got to focus on their craft and got to share how they went through a quarantine, how they went through a pandemic. You don't think that that's gonna have resonance five, 10, 100 years from now, I promise you it will. So that's part of our job of what we have to do. I believe. I, I, I would love to jump in um, on the back of that and, and also uh, listening to folks that are, that are currently actually asking that same question and don't know how to pivot. I think that something that has been brought up by this situation that we're seeing on all levels of the social structure is fragility. And that fragility comes from specificity. And you can see that in the food chain in the, in the just on time delivery stuff and the medical equipment and all of, and all of those situations, but it's also happened in our own industries. And I think that as artists have become a more popular um, demographic of freelance professionals, they've had to differentiate and brand themselves within their niche. And so now what we're seeing is kind of a bifurcation between people whose industries are gonna survive this and their clients are you know, maybe video game companies that are having a boom right now in this situation and they can work from home versus muralists who are completely uh, out of opportunities because they can't leave the house. And so I think that uh, to, to Heather's point, the first thing to look at is, is how can I actually rally in and uh, repurpose my resources and reduce my costs and so there's a there's a an initial framework <clears throat> an initial framework of looking after yourself and, and getting to a stable base uh, and then it's also fine to not know what happens next and to not immediately feel like you have to reorient your whole career online we don't know what's coming next we don't know how long these things are going to have to stay online and it's not just about reorienting immediately to how does my work translate to this new vehicle and how can I begin to publish? There's actually a big space now for people to step back, cover their bases and then say, the world is going to change radically. We don't know to what extent and in what ways, but this is a big change and it's going to change a lot of systemic things in a lot of different ways. And part of our role now is to start thinking into that future. There's going to be a lot of focus on immediate solutions and immediate reorienting, but there's also has to be a role for, for vision, for long-term thinking, because that opens a massive potential space. And if, if there's any other group that is more responsible for setting the emotional and the conceptual tone of what's going to come next more than artists, I don't know who that is. And so, you know, give yourself permission to sit back and take that space to be curious, to observe, to ask questions, to have these discussions and to be imaginative and to come up with ideas for what could come out of this rather than just jumping on the bandwagon and transferring that whole career online. Because there's a big scramble to actually, what we're seeing is to try and preserve the system we have and just convert it to a digital space. And that's, that may work in the short term, but it doesn't solve any of our long-term problems. So if we're going to reduce fragility and, and create stable networks and stable systems that we can live within for the next situation that comes up, that has to begin with the creative act and with imagination. And that is 
perhaps to our surprise, especially if we're, you know, working on video games or something like that, suddenly we're called upon to actually imagine a possible future for the real world. And that can be as exciting as it is terrifying. I wanted to share a, a, just a moment from this, uh, this NASA opportunity I have. Um, it's, and, and by the way, it's, uh, I know that we put this call together and I, I hope that none of this comes across uh, from any of our perspective. Look, like, look at my artwork. That's not what any of this is about. In fact, I'm very reticent to show, show and share this work. It, it has not been fully realized and I don't know where it's going, but I think there have been many lessons earned from this. Um, when the, the way the NASA project worked, uh, I'll tell you what it is. I'm, I'm designing the, uh, the challenge course for the NASA sand project was, which is an autonomous drone challenge course to, to show off a new NASA technology, not in a million freaking years did I expect to be involved with an autonomous drone challenge course. I think actually within the meeting, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that there, it was autonomous. I was like, well, then the pilot is like, there's no pilot. It's like, yeah, but in the pilot, it's like, there's no pilot. Oh, okay. But um, what that project came from was being on location, meeting people, getting, having them assign a value to me that that's a creative person. I can see that. And then a creative thing came up where they didn't have somebody that was creative. And that was it. It wasn't my illustration career or anything else. It was just, I was fresh in their mind. When an opportunity presented itself, the call came in, I rallied two of my colleagues and we put together just a quick proposal and response just to have something. And um, we got invited into a conference call and it was all still volunteer. And in that conference call, they said, um, well, look, we're doing a blue sky conversation next week at NASA Langley. You guys could come out if you want, but you know, we, it's like I'm there. As soon as that opportunity presented itself, I was like, I, I wanna be there. And we, in that meeting, I, I jumped up pretty quickly with a marker and I was drawing. I wasn't illustrating, these weren't quality drawings, but I was adding visuals to abstract ideas. I didn't expect that I would be doing a live drawing thing in front of NASA engineers, but there I was and my colleague jumped up into the same thing. And in that meeting, we went from being people who were in a volunteer base to being offered a contract. Like quite literally in the meeting, they said, we wanna take half the money that was going over here and we wanna give half to VCU's team over here. And that was something that did not exist before we took action and were able to show people something that they couldn't process in their minds, but we had the capability even in rudimentary drawings to show them and say, is this what we're talking about? And a couple of times we got hard no's and other times we got hard yeses. Like, oh, that's exactly what we're talking about. So that's not maybe what I had written down as my dreams and ambitions of what I wanted to do with my career right now. But that opportunity came out of a skill set that I didn't even know that I had to be able to talk and draw in real time. And uh, these things are going to present themselves and they're going to present themselves in physical space. And then there's going to be consulting opportunities in virtual space. And whether someone's opened up the door and said, Hey, we have money to pay you for this thing or you go into a situation and you show people that you have value as a thinker and as a maker and as a drawer and people who can manifest ideas out of abstraction, you will have value in this world. Ooh, can I jump on that Sterling? Am I, am I not muted? Okay, good. Um, where is I going with this? Okay. So uh, recently some personal work that, I've been doing has been getting involved with like augmented and virtual reality. And what I've been seeing from a consulting perspective is that the ability to uh, bring ideas out of a group of people and into the real world in terms of like storyboarding is like absolutely critical to the entire process that ends up involving like, like up to like hundreds of thousands of dollars of like consultants time developers time etc cetera, etc cetera. uh so i think that like yeah that that practice is absolutely critical it's something that like i'm making sure is a point a huge point of the work that i'm doing right now and something i'm pushing for uh 
as I'm working to like help establish this practice in the company that I work for. Dude, that's awesome to hear, man. I, I would say that that practice too, as these governments are scrambling and they're trying to figure out how to respond to this pandemic and, and the situation here uh, and, and different companies are trying to pivot their business model. Those are still abstract ideas where hiring an artist and a visual communicator to, to get to the essence of something and to help them with their pitches and their proposals. Again, it might not be the sexiest thing in the world for us to do right now. I, I enjoy the work, but for, for each of you, it's going to be different. But when, when I mentioned my dad said one door closes and another one opens, people will try to solve these problems. They will solve these problems. They will have to pivot their industries to do that. And if you were there and you were paying attention and you were clear with your, with your intention and your capabilities, to me, that's going to be affording a whole lot of new opportunities that weren't there that may be focused on entertainment and visual communication on that side of it. That's going to things that are very applied right now. Can I, can I follow up with one more thing uh, really fast? Um, I just wanted to share this resource. Uh, this, this book called, uh, this is service design doing, um, this thing, you can see it's full of, uh, full of post-it notes. It's really an incredible resource. I mean, I flipped open to this page here and it kind of has this whole, this whole situation laid out that really, um, parallels a lot of what Adam and Sterling have been talking about of like how to do uh, really like research ideation prototyping and implementation but none of it none of it is industry specific there's examples across industries and most importantly um, what I found really interesting about uh, service design is that like I feel like as artists we've internalized a lot of these processes and have our own kind of like situation of like we get in zone we we make lists and like thumbnails and do whatever else we need to generate ideas and then work towards that. Um, but service design specifically is how to facilitate that with groups of other people, because you, you may not be the expert in something, but if you can be in a group of experts and try and facilitate that creative process in like the hive mind, like I think that that's, that becomes really powerful. Uh, so I can, I'll put the name of this book in the chat, but, uh, it was, it was great. This thing's, things like my Bible. Great resource. Thank you very much. Is this working? Can you hear me? Okay. I think it's working now. Sorry. I was trying to talk before. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I was uh, just talking with a friend. Um, so I'm a digital artist, uh, do a UI artist and 2D artist for a video game company. Uh, we've been, I've been working remotely for them for maybe about two years now and like full time uh, for over a year. So it's been a little bit surreal how little has changed because I just work in my home studio um, and watching a lot of my artist friends, uh, even like the people who were like part time freelancing transition online has been really interesting. Um, and I feel like a lot of it has been partly just getting used to, I think people right now, especially people who are like, they have less work or they're like kind of deciding what to do. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like desire for connection. And I feel people are like struggling really hard and almost like trying too hard. I think like very, I feel like there's like a lot of frantic energy um, right now with people trying to look for direction and look for like what to be doing next. Um, and uh when you work from home for like a couple years where it's just you like i feel like you just kind of get used to that space um and uh it's also you know working for video games it's interesting because now all these people are home kids especially uh the game that we're working on is an online game where we can put a patch in and in a week or so it'll be in the game that everybody's playing and um you know, we're keeping tabs on our own like Discord community and like they're all reacting to it. And um, it's just been interesting because like it went from like, you know, the job that everyone was that a lot, there's a lot of pressure from like, you know, older generations of like, it's not a real job or it's not going to be in <laughs> existent to like, it's been the most stable. <laughs> um, people need the online interaction right now. And um, especially like nowadays, it's, easier than it there's so much information there's so many like resources for learning these programs and like you can you used to not be able to make a 
online video game with a couple people and now there's teams of two who are making really stable systems um and it's a nice avenue for like you know it's a kind of a typical example but i think of like journey which was kind of one of the perfect um games where it was a really limited interaction where you couldn't you like literally couldn't um grief people or like uh, make their mis experience miserable because the interaction was so limited um but the limited connection that they had was really impactful for the people who did play it and that was at a time that was pretty much like a lot the you know the political climate was a lot different then so i think um sort of being open to those kind of like technical avenues um there's a lot of different and it's just interesting too like thinking about that in relation to like the work that you're creating sterling sterling which like i totally understand it um where you're trying to disconnect other than just the like the habit of just like clicking in and i've been this something i've been thinking about a lot too especially with like watching these feeds and trying to stay connected and trying to keep up to date um but there's so it's just so interesting like what you can do and like the kind of con how facilitating connections through video games or through other like kind of kind of like interactive experiences online because that's where people are now looking for it um more than they've they're used to and at times and in ways that they're not used to doing so uh I, this I'm, is, oh go for it Chris. oh uh well i i i just um it's, it's relevant to sort of what's going on with me since i'm making a uh i'm making a game right now um and of course it's a single player game and so it's much more about um escapism uh, i think uh than and connecting with others um, but I feel like right now all of these current events um, it, they've actually lined up pretty well for me I feel very fortunate in that I had set aside this spring and um, part of the summer to kind of hunker down and work on this project and I did so much travel and selling and all the you know all this big event stuff last year and was able to to build up the resources that I need to be able to do this now. Um, but so right now I feel like I'm in exhalation phase. Um, I did a lot of just different experiences in the past couple of years, as well as the selling stuff that I'm now kind of drawing on to work on this thing. But now I'm going into you know a recession economy and <clears throat> wondering you know what people are going to be willing to spend on things like indie games um, and. Uh, the one thing I feel like I have going for me is most of the most of the worlds that my game are is, is um, featuring are are fairly bright. It's like humanity has figured out how to solve a lot of a lot of the problems we're dealing with now. And I, I remember coming across on social media this term like bright art for dark times. Um, and it, it seems like when things are going really well, um, a lot of a lot of artistically a lot of the entertainment tends to be like what if everything went wrong and I think when things actually are going wrong then people turn towards wanting to to think about how the world could be as things went better um, and so I'm hoping that you know that the art the artistic vision in, in this game will align with what people need right now um, so I haven't planned to change um, the content of the project or what my roadmap was over the past over the next few months, but I I do feel very fortunate that this what what's happening now didn't happen last year, and I really feel for uh, my friends in the convention convention communities uh, because they're uh, they're really getting hit hard right now. Um, so many people like invested thousands of dollars in, in buying tables, um, and then they're not able to to recoup that money this year. Um, but yeah, back to the game. Um, yeah, I uh, I have I have a I have a lot of hope um, that will it'll still be able to be a viable thing despite um, the times we're in and um, yeah <laughs> yeah I I thank you uh, for sharing and I I'm also in a fortunate position uh, with my work for Magic and they're pivoting towards the arena online stuff. And I think that there are probably a number of us in this group that uh, share that privilege to be on the creator side in the game world. And, you know, to ask the question of what does it mean to be embedded? You know, we talk a lot about getting off computers and getting back out into the world, but this is also a part of the world. And to think about what does it mean to be embedded 
in digital communities and in gaming communities, you know, to remember that in fact, most of that community is not on the creation side, they're on the player side and they're looking for escape or they're looking for community uh, or they're looking for relaxation or whatever that is. And, you know, it is, it's possible certainly for me and maybe for others to be much more deeply integrated in those communities. I very rarely speak to the player base of the game that I spend most of my life creating artwork for. And so that's something for me personally that I really want to do is, is to not just continue making magic, but also to get involved where time <clears throat> permits in that community of people uh, that, that interact with my work and actually find out, you know, like, how does this make you feel? How does this help? Uh, you know, what, what kinds of discussions are happening in this community alongside the games. Um, so it's, a, it's certainly a time that we're going to have to branch out into different types of communities, maybe than, than just our own artistic one. And, you know, our, yeah. our, our situations are fluid too. And, uh, you know, those of us who are fortunate to have some type of uh, salary position or something of that nature. I'm still working at the university. Um, I have this understanding that my efforts as an educator, you know, can go a long ways towards proving or disproving that this, this, this model can work. And so that creative practice, you know, if, if I'm looking at, higher education, and this, this is going to sound uh, maybe arrogant to think that as an individual, I have this type of impact. My point is that my efforts, I'm approaching it as if those efforts can see that we can do this online or that they will prove that we cannot. And if we cannot, then that revenue stream is gone, right? So there, there's a, even a, a recognition that within that band, of, of influence at the university, I can say, you know, I'm, I want to keep teaching. I like my job there. Um, and I can go into a panic and I say, well, there's just no way that any of this stuff can happen online. And it, it, there's, there's, there's no way that you can teach art online. Obviously I feel different about that, but a lot of my colleagues are going to, going to respond that way. I say, well, but look, what, look at what you're saying. If this is the new norm, then moving forward means that the norm will change. The norm is not going to be there. That that position will not be there. So, I think each of us uh, is going to need to really take stock of of those things that are challenging. Those things that are um, we know that are going to, going to change or have changed already. Uh, to be thankful and grateful for the things that we do have, uh, but also realize that not everybody's in that situation. I've got so many friends who are in the service industry, waiting tables instantly overnight. That industry is gone. You know, it's changed. These small businesses that people have started up that have been living on the narrowest of margins gone instantly overnight. And that's the place where I think that we need to start thinking about um, where do we have impact? Where do we have influence? What unique skill sets do we have uh, that can amplify those markets or those individuals? And I will say that there's been some things over the course of the past two to three years where I've realized that very minimal efforts on my part have had significant impact on an individual, not large groups, but an individual who something I could do could significantly change or alter the state of mind that they're in or the place that they're in or to help them out. And as Adam said, we've got to take care of ourselves first and foremost, but beyond that, we're going to be seeking this inquiry of how can we as artists impact and change the world around us? Yeah, I, I, I think that what's happening or what, what may potentially happen uh, as this progresses is a kind of dissolving of the solidified idea of, this, of the artist as separate to other roles. And there's a, there's a document that I'll, I'll also link in the resources called The Situational Assessment by Jordan Hall. Uh, it's something that he, he tends to put out every six months or so. And it's kind of a systems thinking uh, overview of what's happening in the world. And uh, for the present situation, what he focused on was looking at different intersections of fragile industries. So whether that's logistics and medicine or medicine and transport or tourism and um, logistics, these kinds of things. 
uh, and, and identifying these kind of flashpoints that are, that are going to compound each other in this situation. And so what I think we can do right now is to allow that identity that we've concretized as I am an artist, this is my style, this is what I do, this is my medium, to dissolve that out into recognition of all of the different ways that we think and, and our patterns of behavior that are actually quite deeply learned and strong and to consider like to actually just look through that list and say, how can I imagine solutions to these different frameworks? Which one resonates with me and how can I apply the same kind of problem solving and design thinking that I would use for my work to a problem that two weeks ago I would have thought is completely above my pay grade and out of my realm of experience. I think, these changes are, are so dynamic right now that everyone kind of has permission to begin innovating into those spaces. I think the, the, the playing field has been flattened by the level of need for us to get on with creating solutions. Sterling, did you, did you want to speak to um, maybe next steps? Yeah, and, and uh, I think Adam, if this can kind of dovetail into your observations and how you're planning on using your limitations in your space, uh, if, if that's what you're asking about. So um, I'll give you a, a, another example here of something that's happening. So from these partnerships at the, uh, the hospital, um, I put together, it was, it was a bit of a, without realizing it, kind of a situational assessment of my observations while I was there for the six months. And I came up with uh, about 12 different items that I thought were impactful things that could be introduced at the hospital level within the different units that I was interacting with or within the general hospital itself. And, you know, admittedly, there was some initial excitement about those things. And then they, they just kind of uh, sputtered out. And it's because I didn't have the right champions on board. There was no funding mechanism that I'd identified. And I, I, some of the most engaging and exciting ideas were built around the children's hospital and the fact that they're building a new uh, children's hospital pavilion and there's a huge focus and effort going into that. Well, I had a meeting set up for tomorrow and as I knew it would, it was canceled. And, you know, what I responded with was, you know, look, I'm, I'm hoping that we can hold the meeting date. I said, I realize that we can't meet in person, but the segment that we're trying to approach and affect through these efforts are actually the long-term inpatient children in the children's hospital. And I said, we would never, we've never had a more um, obvious time of, of understanding and being empathetic to somebody who's been in long-term inpatient care than what we have right now. And I said, these, these tools that we're looking to introduce are the very tools that we would be looking to, to integrate into uh, this isolation that these kids are feeling and that their families are feeling. The reason I mention that is we're still having the meeting tomorrow. We'll be online. I hope that I don't um, balk when I go into the meeting, but it's a, it's a very high level engagement. And I, I'm introducing this as a point because next week I'll know whether I failed or succeeded at my intent. But had I not interjected and said, but wait, there's an opportunity here. There's an, there's an idea here of taking these things, these parallel experiences and finding resonance and connection between them, then the opportunity most definitely would have failed. So those things are, are things that I put into motion back before the world uh, pivoted the way that it has. Um, but I would imagine that each of you, none of you has been sitting idle. None of you has been waiting for someone to discover you or to, to uh, be introduced with a huge opportunity. You're, you're, you're digging and you're scratching and you're seeking. And I would say that if you took another assessment of where you stand and your limitations and your connections and your communities, that you're going to find that entirely new avenues have presented themselves. And you say, wait a second, I hadn't thought about that before. And it'll be right there in front of you uh, more often than not. So that's something that's uh, happening in real time that uh, it was born out of just observations and trying to stitch together known resources. Again, it's not me going out and drawing somebody a picture. 
It's not me illustrating a point. It's to me having a, the ability to visually communicate, to take abstract concepts and put resources together. So that's kind of where I stand with things right now. Uh, Adam, I guess that, I hope that was what you were asking about and uh, would love to hear what we talked about before. If you can talk a bit about what's right outside your window. And I know that in Berlin right now, you're you know, limited to groups of two of going out, correct? Right, so uh, as of yesterday, um, the limitations for us are basically that, yeah, we can go out uh, with one other person um, that, shares, that shares the household with us. Um, I think people are also allowed to meet for important uh, exams and things like that. But in terms of public space, it's, um, it's two people at a time. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, all of my work is, is kind of either studio based, uh, or, um, public based right now, studio based for work and public for my personal stuff. And so, uh, it's, it's been a very jarring conceptual thing for me to reorient from my, the whole point of my work is to do it in public to there's no such thing as public now. Um, today I... Uh, realize that that's not necessarily the case. In Berlin, we basically have uh, street blocks of apartment buildings, and in between all of those buildings is kind of a shared central courtyard. Um, and I've seen people over the last few days, one by one, kind of going down to walk the dog. It's a, it's fairly big. It's you know the size of a of a block, so there's enough space to walk a dog, uh, probably even to run and do a few laps and things like that. And I was just struck by the sudden complete recontextualization of this space that I'd never seen anyone in before as kind of the public forum. Um, and so I'm, I'm keeping my intention really simple, but I really want to continue. I, I think that now is a really important time here in Berlin for people to still physically see other people doing things. I don't want everything to be so reoriented online that, that we lose that connection to other real human beings. Um, so my, my intention is very simple, which is to take a big canvas down into the courtyard and do a painting uh, and wait. And, you know, to play with this kind of uh, all of what my work has been about, which is about being witnessed and this relationship between the observer and the subject and the artist and all of these things and to suddenly put yourself in a position where you may or may not be being observed by a lot of people behind these windows. And you are kind of the focal point that allows for the beginning of a communication. So I'm interested to see if someone uh, calls out the window, if someone decides to come down and say hello, hopefully one at a time uh, and to make a space, you know, to, to, there's a couple of benches down there and to sort of open that space for people to come down and, um, sit and talk and you know what a finally what an amazing opportunity to meet all of those neighbors that we somehow managed never to meet for years and years um, so let's see where that experiment in using art to bring uh, a very new local kind of community together goes that's where my mind's at right now Adam I'm curious how you'll logistically do that will you set up I don't know, some kind of a physical barrier around you, chairs, that kind of thing, or like just, just to distance people from actually coming up to you. And we have a two meter rule here. So. Right. Yeah. We, we have the same rule. And uh, I think, I think it should be, I mean, people seem to be taking it seriously and it should be fairly self-explanatory. I was thinking, you know, do I, do I need a big red circle around me or, you know, some of the videos of people in Italy that have built these giant kind of UFO outfits that are hanging off them. Um, but no, I think, you know, I think part of it is, is kind of the strangeness and the humor and the weirdness of this situation. And I think I would prefer to, uh, at least in that, enclosed space to navigate that directly and when someone comes down to actually say you know feel free to take a seat to establish that space you know the the last thing that i want is to bring that that sudden uh kind of social uncertainty into a space that really essentially is neighbors and in an ideal world should be a trusted situation so i i hope to open that engagement with trust 
with the trust that they understand the situation and, and respect that. And, you know, of course, if someone just naturally has the, the inclination to come and, and stand behind the canvas, then it's just a matter of saying, you know, let's make sure that we, that we keep the, the distance. Um, but I, you know, that'll be a, that'll be my kind of problem framing, right? How big is the canvas to be seen from all of these apartments? What do I paint? What kind of space do I set up? Um, you know, and, and, and how, and also just a language barrier for me, you know, most of the people are going to be German speaking and my, my German is not fantastic. So a lot of it is also going to be exploring nonverbal communication and just, you know, there's a lot to be said for just allowing that space for people to come and sit and watch something that isn't a computer screen. So to be, to be decided. Wonderful idea. I mean, my, your first thought is whenever you draw in public, the, the automatic response is for people to stand over your shoulder, lean in close. So just that, it, I mean, it's a whole new world now, right? Um, right? Almost if you had behind you a semicircle of spaced chairs, where I, I'm just thinking out loud, where people can observe you from behind, but they're aware of that distance, but they can still communicate between each other. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, in fact, we, we're actually not allowed any gatherings of over two people, even if they're a certain distance apart. So wow. it, it is really limited to one person at a time. And uh, I don't know what the, what the definition of a gathering is. I assume if someone comes down to take the garbage out that we're not going to you know, interrupt their, their flow. But um, yeah, I, I think, and, you know, and there's going to be something beautiful about that too, that it isn't an audience and an artist. It's going to be two people sharing that space and, and communicating. My first problem is actually that my particular building is fenced off from the courtyard and, and I have to figure out a way to jump the fence and get my painting gear in there and hope that everyone understands that it's uh, extenuating circumstances. So, you know, all of these, all of these strange things that we have to negotiate all of a sudden become our, become our creative brief, you know? It would, it would make a really interesting um, time-lapse video of just, people one at a time coming and going and receiving. Yeah, I'm imagining a Hitchcock rear window yeah, exactly. kind of framing, yeah. you know, black and white, weird artist in the courtyard. Yeah. Adam, I don't know the layout of your building, but like how big is the canvas going to be? Is it going to be a wall? Like, so I, I'm actually limited um, to what I managed to bring back from my studio, which is like a, maybe a 15 foot roll of canvas, uh, which I could, throw on the ground or maybe stretch between trees or something like that. Um, you know, otherwise, I don't know what the next biggest thing I have is, but it, it may very well just be, actually I have a giant circular frame here from another project. So that's, uh, that's about. But, but is there a wall? Like, um, no, out? and I also don't have the materials to, or the uh, permission to do that. So if you, if you maybe you want to. Yeah, I'll just mail you some, no problem. Yeah, mail me some. <laughs> No, I, I think, you know, and I think it's also about, um, it's, it's my practice. Like it could even be a sketchbook. I think just, you know, if, if I was to look out the window and see someone down there sketching, my first instinct would be, who is this person? And, and you know, what are they doing down there? So I think just making it obvious enough that it's an invitation, um, that I'm clearly doing this in the middle of a shared space is enough for people to hopefully make contact. Let's see. You know, when I hear that, and Emily, I hear your statement as well. Um, there's something about the transience of, of, of this, this uh, temporary nature of what we're dealing with. And, you know, Adam, to hear you say that, your, your limit of resources, that you don't have infinite canvases, that you can't replenish those things, may drive the thesis. It, it may be something that is, you know, look, I'm wiping out. 30% of my painting every day. And the point is not the finished painting, the point is the act of painting. And you know, I've, I've had a show where I've done that before, where I said, anything that I like that I paint, I will destroy. And I know that sounds so counterintuitive, but it came from reading uh, about how writers are, are, are you know, drafting a manuscript. And if there's a passage that stands out that is so much better than everything else, your charge is either to make everything else better or to scratch out the thing that's so exceptionally uh, different. And there might be something to 
the theory or the idea of saying I have limited roles uh, of, of canvas. I am going to go back out to the courtyard. I'm going to document the process digitally to go through and actually record this and people can access that from their their rooms or their their apartments and there's something to that that like i'm this is a, an act of defiance i'm going outside because we are not allowed to i'm you know going through this process because i need to make something with my hands and you can engage with it this way and emily i, I see your situation there where your act of defiance might be that you don't have a wall to go to so you dedicate a wall in your apartment or your studio to creating a mural that you're going to continue to work on and then paint over and continue to work through. I think that there's something to this that um, we have to remember that it's not inherently the artifact. That's not the only thing that has value here. It's the, the idea, the intellectual property, the process, the method, the willpower, the hope that we are going to continue to make things that connect with people over time and space. And I think if we remember that, then we remember our charge as artists. I have to say that it's, um, as someone who lives in kind of a totally different situation as everyone else, I live in a state where we do social distancing year round. There's not a ton of people in Montana. And I am a plein air painter. I have to deal with people getting up in my space. I have dogs, I have all this stuff. and almost all of the sales communication I do are online. Very little of it's on person. Um, if it's any comfort in the fine art world, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but with my experience in the sales and the making of art, um, both as a gallery director and an artist, the art world's been making moves to be completely online for about five years now. So this might feel like, oh my God, we're all online now. Um, and I can't speak for other people's trades, but really it's not that different. Like my sister-in-law, she works for Sotheby's and almost everything's online. The stuff in person is kind of the party part um, from my experience. But I will say that another sort of positive thing of this, um, as someone who in the winter, I'm a full-time artist, but in the summer, I'm not. My gardening season's coming up, which I'm really fortunate that that can keep going. But it's been cool seeing on Instagram and Facebook, all the artists are doing live videos more so than they've ever done. They're sharing things. There have been so many people plein air painting in cities where they know people. Um, people are sharing more. Like a lot of my friends who all of a sudden their shows are canceled. I have shows that are canceled in July um, are sharing their, um, there's not as many boundaries, which is nice to see, because one of sort of Sterling's contemporaries, I guess you could say, uh, Matt Lively, said to me, he says this to every artist, um, just make it and show it, don't worry about it, because we can't predict what people like. And he's right, so just share. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wanted to like talk about the same thing. It was actually funny, the first time I've ever been into the office for work uh, was, I guess, in February for the first time in almost uh, four and a half years. And it's strange, actually, since everyone's had to move online, it's kind of made me realize that there's actually like two languages culturally being spoken between artists and people who traditionally do in-person type work and conversation are very much like flooding into this space. And I, I've actually noticed some some odd friction. <laughs> There's like an online etiquette that I think that has had like a lot of development over many, many years now because it's it's been around um, for a very, very long time. And I think the, the best thing to come out of that is to say that, that there is plenty of work. Like I think it's all there. I think the a lot of the intensity and I the funny thing too is I make video games and I draw traditionally for those video games currently. Like that's what they requested, that's what they want, and like that's what I do. So I haven't really left my roots and I do what I want to do and that all of that work is really there. It's just like the method of seeking out that work is just going to change, I think, perhaps. And I think it's like 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like that's all I have is the, the comfort, the comfort to say, like, there's plenty of work that the lull is, is maybe superficial, that it's only because, again, it's a different type of language, the conversation is, is shifting. So, um, yeah, it's weird. I think, like, I, I wrote down the, the note, too, of what you said, Adam. Um, specifically, it was... Uh, no such thing as public anymore. And it, it was very, very strange to me because it that that sensation of flood of people into the online work as artists uh, became extremely apparent because the online public space that's very established, uh, it was like felt like you could feel the pressure. I think I think online artists, uh, felt like a, a panic or like this surge of other people who were like, I don't know what to do in this space, um, even if people are unaware of it. But like, or I guess even the people who are the artists who maybe are un, unaware of that space. Um, but yeah, I think I think the online community is like very, the online artist community is very aware of finding communication in a granular format with individuals and it's it's very keen on doing that because you can be more particular you can find like massive finite public spaces or like huge chaotic spaces for art or you can find like the small community who's willing to support strange esoteric artwork as well i i don't know like and you don't have to be fully online either i think um I would really recommend getting in touch uh, with like your analogous online or offline ver like version of yourself and see if there's maybe not like a communication cross that people can find in that format. Um, and I think that'll just let people continue doing what they do. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, this, this, thank you. This was a, this is something that came up recently in a, in another sense making call, uh, not with artists, but with a group of people talking about community and community building uh, now. And it was this idea of the Dunbar number. Um, so this idea that, you know, humans are kind of built to operate in groups of the number kind of changes, but around about 150. And that's sort of the capacity that we evolved to hold relationship with at the same time. And then there was this discussion about, you know, right, but that's, that was people in a tribe, that was people in a physical location that had these very complex and very kind of um, high risk relationships. I mean, there was the risk of, you know, physical violence, there was the risk of theft, there were all of these kind of things that are somehow um, diminished in the online world. And so there was this discussion that came up around does the Dunbar number or how does the Dunbar number or that idea or principle apply to online communities? And one of the things that's starting to come up is the idea of, of kind of a Dunbar of Dunbars, <laughs> which is essentially that each person may be now entering into a state of relationship with 150 network edges rather than 150 people. So basically you, you, rather than having relationships with 150 individuals, you have relationships with 150 points of access to other networks. And so this is one way of, of kind of understanding the evolution of our collective sense making as we kind of, there's this sort of big gap between the individual ability to hold information and the massive amount of information out there. And so we're kind of struggling to bridge that gap with networks that help us make sense of that. And I think that is what we're seeing now online is kind of like Legendeer for me becomes one out of 150 points of information in my edge system. And within that, there may be another limit on how many people can kind of sustain that community and then so on and so on and so forth. And each one of us is no longer in a village of 150 people you know, that, that one person that I'm connected to, like Sterling, has a completely different 150 or however many people than what I do. We don't actually share those groups anymore. So it's new territory. And, you know, hopefully to speak to that point about online community, what I hope comes out of this is a much more mature etiquette and sense making in those online groups 
coupled with a deeper appreciation and, a, and an understanding of what offline connection means and looks like in contrast to that. And I can imagine small communities, sustainable off-grid community kind of ideas becoming much more functional now when you say, okay, we've got 150 people that are going to try and live together or 20 people in a, in a shared living situation or something like that. But each one of those people is so widely connected to support and information that that functions much better than it ever could. So we could see a beautiful hybrid on online offline thing begin to emerge. Waffle. Uh, we are just about uh, running up on two hours of, of talk time. Um, so I would love for us to bring the official part of this call to a close. Uh, we do have a little bit more uh, information to share with you all. Um, but for now, let's stop the recording. And once again, thank you for anyone that's listened into this. If you want to find out more about what we're doing, legendeer.org is the place to go. And there will be more uh, videos and calls to come soon. Sterling, could you please shut the recording?